You see, something's going to happen. What? What's going to happen? Something wonderful. What? I understand how you feel. You see, it's all very clear to me now. Welcome to the Occult Rejects. In this episode, I'm very happy to uh, have this guest back. Uh, we did a two-part uh, mini-series already, and it is a, was an awesome series. A lot of info, a lot of receipts, and a lot of, well, it's a good reception. And I highly suggest to go check out the videos on YouTube, because the amount of comments and stuff added is uh, very impressive. Um, and today, as usual, I got the Cult Rejects co-host, Mad Scientist Lisa, joining us. Uh, thank you very much for jumping on with me, Lisa. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm very excited about this one. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Um, do you want to let everybody know where they can uh, get in touch with you if they want to? Me? Yes. Um, so Lisa, on Twitter, so Lisa, Lisa. Um, Instagram, Lisa Solis. And also, we have a cult research institute.org. Check out the website. We've got some good stuff to read. Hell yeah, hell yeah. And as uh, we start recording a few more things going forward, it will also be dropped in, uh, you know, reading format. So there should be mm -hmm. new stuff dropping, uh, fairly new from us at least, besides other people. And uh, Ethan Indigo is even dropping something. If he didn't already, he's got something he's adding uh, soon. So there's definitely stuff being added to there. Go check it out. Uh, and finally, to the guest, the man himself, Justin from LDS Abuse. How are you? Thank you very much for coming on, my man. Oh, well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on again. So, Oh, no, for sure. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to today. We, we have some interesting stuff, I think. So, Yes. <laughs> you know, and just real quick, uh, I know you're going to do like a, maybe a small little recap, but uh, for people who are just, you know, maybe tuning in for the first time, haven't listened to the other two, um, you know, Justin was kind of like just came out of nowhere, kind of fell into my lap and had found the connection to something that I thought was weird. I was, my opinion, when we were looking into smiley face killer deemed, you know, accounts, uh, I thought something was fishy going on with the Rotary Club in Austin. And then for someone, you know, for him now to be pointing this out with the Rotary Club and Mormonism, I'm just like, what is going on? Very wild and interesting series, and I highly suggest to go check those out if you haven't already. Uh, and this one, I'm sure, is going to be just as wild as the other two. But, uh, Justin, I guess real quick, if you don't mind, maybe give us a little bit of a recap of kind of like where we're going from what you just covered. Yeah, you bet. So, I mean, so the overall deal for me is I started out as a researcher in the space of, um, like, sexual abuse in the church. And like you said, sort of out of nowhere, as I was on Twitter, some people reached out and said, hey, it's much bigger than that, and you need to be looking, like, broadening the scope of this. And as I did that, um, I started finding relationships between the church and the Central Intelligence Agency and the church and the FBI and the church and the NSA and, and all these things. And then one day, randomly sort of got turned on to this idea of the Mormon Church and Rotary International, uh, which as a lifelong member of the church, I had never heard of at all. But as soon as I started looking into it, it turns out that it's there's a huge entanglement and enmeshment between the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Rotary International, which to me is important because Rotary International is very open about their partnership with um, the United Nations, right? And um, we've talked about in the last couple episodes sort of that history, you know, of uh, that relationship between the Mormon Church and Rotary International and some of these other organizations. And uh, so what I've done is over the last couple of weeks, I've gone back and done a couple uh, uh, more digs. And uh, I have some more information that I think is going to be uh, really interesting to just sort of, um, uh, you know, here's my problem. The Mormon Church has um, a narrative, right? And I think what we're going to show today is that that narrative um, while it might be historically accurate in the sense that the things that they talk about are true, it's not even a fraction of the actual story about how Mormonism grew and prospered and why it grew and prospered and and then the consequences of, of the choices made by Mormon leadership over the last 160 years. And so today I think what I'm hoping to do is, is sort of lay out an even firmer foundation historically 
as to why the Mormon church is what we observe today, right? Yeah, I really have to say it is pretty, again, you know, going back at the looking at the other two episodes, you really, for me, I really have to, I would think anybody would have to question really what is the message the Mormon church is even trying to put out today, mm. you know, yeah. due, due to so, yeah. changes. Yep. So if we're ready, I mean, I could just, I have a ton of stuff. My, sure, my biggest sure. concern is I probably just have too much stuff so we can just hop in and feel free to stop me at any time and ask any questions that you want to. And, um, you know, for those who didn't watch the first two episodes, the way I like to do this, I just like to set it up on a chronology and then we can go through, um, one, one step at a time and it sort of keeps me focused and, uh, and then we can stop and, and take questions if we need to. So, so, um, I chose to call this, um, timeline, the predator pipeline, a brief history of the LDS church's descent into bondage and its consequences. And I want to start out just by talking about what I mean by the predator pipeline, because, there certainly is this, um, you know, sexual abuse predation going on inside of the church. And I'm going to talk about that at the end of today's presentation quite a bit. But to me, it's really a lot more than that. And it's not even, I mean, the sexual abuse is obviously like the worst form of abuse that the church, you know, it, it protects. And, and then it does happen inside of their buildings. It does happen by their priesthood holders. It does happen, um, you know, all over the world. But to me, when I'm talking about the predator pipeline, I want to put it in a broader historical context today. And what I'm really talking about is a group of people who sort of prey upon the hearts and the minds and the spirits and the bodies of the people that they claim to serve. And what we're going to look at today is um, how the Mormon church sort of um, became a part of what I of this predator pipeline from the 1860s all the way up until today, 2024, and literally relevant to some news from today that we'll see at the end of uh, the presentation. So I want to start out. Um, I know that there aren't a lot of Mormons who are going to watch this, but for those who do stumble across this, I really want to point out that what I'm trying to do here is actually do what um, the Mormon prophet Russell and Nelson has talked to us about doing. And so he gave a talk back in um, the 1970s, and he is a cardiac surgeon. And so he says, cardiac surgeons speak of the heart in terms of its structural integrity. The word integrity is related to the word integer, which means entire or whole. Integrity may be defined as unimpaired. Integrity also means incorruptible, a firm adherence to a code of values. Integrity denotes a state of completeness. If any component of the heart loses its integrity, the heart is impaired and a vicious cycle ensues. And so my overall message is simply this, like, I always say that anybody can say anything, but actions reveal intent. And it really bothers me as an individual and as a human being to have this man who uh, is out giving talks to my friends and family and people that I love and care for and have served my entire life about integrity, when in the background, he's a member of Skull and Bones, he's covering up for pedophiles, he's doing all these things. And so, uh, you know, I have an issue with that. and. You know, President Nelson and I don't agree necessarily on how to resolve these kinds of differences of opinion. And you can see that here because Russell and Nelson on Facebook posted this. He says, differences of opinion are part of life, which I agree with. I work daily with people who sometimes see an issue differently. He talks about his two noble counselors, again, using these words, noble counselors, and Stalin Oaks and Henry B. Iron have taught me how to disagree in a Christ-like way. So here's what Russell and Nelson says about disagreeing in a Christ-like way. He says, we should express our feelings with love. We should not think that we know the best. We shouldn't compete. And then there's one in here that really sort of gets my goat a little bit. He says, don't rigorously defend your positions. And I just don't agree with President Nelson about this. I think in situations like the one that we're in, we should rigorously defend our opinions. And I honestly have a hard time believing that President Oaks believes in not rigorously defending your positions too, because he was a lawyer, and then he was a Utah Supreme Court judge, and there were rumors that he was uh, in the running for, U uh, for Supreme Court of the United States judgeship. So this idea that we shouldn't rigorously defend our positions, I think, is a little bit silly. And so today, like, I'm not going to follow the prophet, and I'm going to rigorously defend the position that there has been what President Nelson talks about in terms of a loss of integrity inside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and a vicious cycle has ensued. And it goes way further back than the men who run the church today. 
So to start, I want to just read this, this quote, and this doesn't necessarily have to do with Mormonism um, per se, but this is uh, Sir Josiah Stamp, who was the director and president of the Bank of England during the 1920s. So during the time period that we're talking about, but over in England, he says, the modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them the power to create money and control credit. And with the flick of a pen, they will create enough money to buy it back again. Take this great power away from the bankers and all the great fortunes like mine will disappear. And they ought to disappear, for this would be a better and happier world to live in. But if you wish to remain the slaves of bankers and pay the cost of your own slavery, let them continue to create money and to control credit. And what I would propose to you is that what Sir Josiah Stamp is describing here is exactly what happened in Utah. And what I'd like to do is prove that through the historical record. So before I get into sort of the banking aspect of this, I want to go and I want to go back in history a little bit further than, um, than when this happened, because there's some important Mormon history that needs to be covered uh, before we get to sort of one of the central characters in the story here. So I want to start with this idea of blood atonement. And blood atonement is something that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints did teach. And if you were to talk to a Mormon today, they would deny this and they would say that it was never a doctrine and so on and so forth. But the fact is that a man by the name of Jedediah M. Grant and Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball were all preaching blood atonement back in the 1850s. And the idea of blood atonement is pretty simple. It's that there are some sins that you commit that can't be solved by any other means by, than by the shedding of the sinner's blood. So Jedediah M. Grant is um, important because he was uh, a counselor to Brigham Young when the Latter-day Saints moved across to Utah. And so he is about as high up in the church as you can get. And he's out there, and, and based on the historical record, what I saw is that he was the first person to publicly preach this on July 27, 1854. So as part of this preaching, you know, we talked about in, in the first um, episode about how there was a succession crisis in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints after Joseph Smith died. And um, what you see in the historical record is that, that for a while, Brigham Young and I think the saints were really hopeful that a descendant of Joseph Smith would come and take over the church eventually. But unfortunately, because of the way that they behaved, none of the people that were really tight with Joseph Smith really wanted to follow Brigham Young. And so what you end up seeing is that in 1856 and 1857, they have what's called the Mormon Reformation. And the Reformation is, it's, it's acknowledged by the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it's talked about as a, like they, you know, it's, it's a reformation, but I would really emphasize that it wasn't just a reformation, it was a reformation, right, of the church. And these guys were preaching things like Adam God doctrine, they were pre preaching things like blood atonement, and so on and so forth, and just a lot of things that the church has had to disavow and walk away from over the years because they're just so kind of out there. In addition to that, Brigham Young and Heber Kimball and Jedediah M. Grant just weren't great dudes. Like they were, they were literally castrating and maybe not they specifically, but their acolytes, their followers were literally castrating men. If like, say, say Brigham Young wanted your, um, your wife as his wife. If you said no, well, you might end up castrated, and Brigham Young would back up that bishop. Bishop Snow is the bishop that I'm thinking of um, in the story that, I, that I'm that i aware of. And so these guys just weren't great people, right? And um, as they sort of realized that none of Joseph's relatives were going to come and save the church, something really strange happened. And I don't know how many people know about this. I didn't know about this until this week when I was doing research, but I think this is really fascinating. So what ends up happening is that a woman by the name of Rachel Ivins um, had been approached by Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, um, and she had problems with polygamy. And so instead of going to Joseph's house to meet with him, she went back to New Jersey, where she was from. And the Ivins family was an extremely prominent family out in New Jersey. Uh, when you look at the historical record there, you'll see that uh, the Ivins family had like the biggest house in their city, right? And some of them joined the church and some of them didn't. Well, Rachel decides to run back to New Jersey. And then for some reason that I'm not, I haven't been able to dig out yet, 
she ends up heading back to Utah. And when she gets to Utah, these, these men know that Joseph Smith wanted her as a polygamous wife. And so what they tell her is, look, Joseph wanted you as a polygamous wife, so we're not going to marry you in the temple. What we're going to do is you can choose one of us to be the polygamous wife of, and um, we'll have children, but our child will be sort of a proxy prophet, right? He will be like a spiritual descendant of Joseph Smith. And I might not be saying that exactly right, but it's, it's the idea. And you can find this in the Leonard J. Arrington, who was the church historian. You can find it in his journals, which are hosted by the University of Virginia. And here's what this says. It says, Rachel was sealed to the prophet Joseph first and then married civilly to Jedediah M. Grant. The account also states that Heber J. Grant during his lifetime was always concerned because he was not sealed to his father. Apparently, this was true since Rachel Ridgway Ivins wasn't sealed to President Grant's father, Jedediah Morgan Grant, until 1992. Now, this is a little bit of inside baseball for people who aren't members of the church. This may not make a lot of sense because like, they're using words like sealed in this kind of a thing. But this is really critical because in order to be born in the covenant, what the Mormons call born in the covenant, you have to be born to two people who are sealed in the temple. And apparently, Rachel Ivins and Jedediah Grant weren't sealed until 1992. And so I went out and we verified this. And so what I have here is a couple of um, screenshots. Is that not going to work? Well, here, we're going to trick it because um, it's down here too. Here we go. So here's where in family search, which is the church's um, family history um, information system repository, you can see that it says that Heber J. Grant, Heber Jetty Grant, did, does not need to be sealed to his parents because he was born in the covenant and does not need to be sealed to his parents. And then it lists his parents as Jedediah Morgan Grant and Rachel Ridgway Ivins. But the problem is... If you go look at Rachel Ridgway Ivins in Family Search, you can see very clearly that she was not sealed to Jedediah Morgan Grant until the 23rd of July, mm -hmm. 1992. Okay? So we start off today with a question that would be probably more profound and powerful if it was a, a group of Mormons that were watching this, because this is really a conundrum. Because you can't claim that Heber J. Grant was born under the covenant, or, I mean, you can claim that he was born under a covenant, but it can't be the covenant that we talk about in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as being born under the covenant because his parents weren't sealed to each other. And this is one of those things that, like, mm. I mean, I was in the church for 44 years and never had any idea that Heber J. Grant was born to a woman sealed to Joseph Smith but civilly married to Jedediah M. Grant so that they could have sort of a proxy prophet. Now, in order to sort of get people focused on this idea that Heber J. Grant was going to be um, the prophet, it was important that these leaders, Brigham Young, Jedediah Grant, and Heber Kimball, get it into the people's heads that, that Heber was going to be um, a really you know, powerful man in the church. And so what we have is a story. Um, sorry, there we go. A story from Family Search about Rachel Ivins Grant, Heber's mother, telling um, Heber, her son, about a time that Heber C. Kimball prophesied in the name of Jesus Christ that uh, Heber J. Grant would become powerful in the church. And I find this really fascinating. So I'm going to skip the top half, and I'm going to start um, uh, down here where it says, um, let's see. I knew it would come true if you did not live early, but it has come true. Then she said, do you remember Heber C. Kimball's picking you up when you were a young boy and putting you on a table and talking to you at a great dinner he was having with a lot of his friends? So notice this is in front of the prominent members of the church, right? Because you got to get this idea in people's head that this proxy Joseph Smith descended is going to be a leader in the church. So Heber J. Grant says, yes. And Rachel says, do you remember anything he said? And this is just, this just blew my mind when I saw this. But Heber J. Grant says, no, I only remember he had the blackest eyes. 
I thought I ever looked into, and I was frightened. That is all I can remember. Rachel goes on to say, he prophesied in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you should become an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and become a greater man in the church than your own father. And your own father, as you know, became one of the counselors to Brigham Young. That is why I told you to behave yourself. So I think we have here one of the first cases of programming the Mormon people. And we've talked a little bit in the other episodes about the CIA and, and what the CIA does and how the LDS church endorses the mission of the CIA. But I think what we have here is sort of this first instance of programming of the programming of a large group of Heber C. Kimball's friends with the idea and the concept that Heber J. Grant was going to be a great leader in the church. Now, the problem is that Heber J. Grant didn't want to be a leader in the church. He's very clear about that. And he, it's even in the story up above. He says, mother, get it out of your head. I do not want to be an apostle. I do not want to be a bishop. I do not want to be anything but a businessman. Just get it out of your head. Okay? So we have this sort of weird situation where a man with black eyes that's frightening a child is prophesying in front of a large group of prominent Mormons that, uh, that Heber J. Grant's going to be a prophet in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But Heber J. Grant really has no interest in that. He wants to be a businessman. And a businessman he was. Um, and I think we're going to see that as we go through this. Well, you should just today. get into religion if you want to be a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be pretty good business, right? 10% yeah. of everybody's income in order to have access to the temple. Um, and you don't even have to sell anything, right? Mm -hmm. Except for salvation, I guess. So, Justin, I have a quick question. Don't uh, most recruits of higher level FBI, CIA, um, I guess, employees come from the Mormon church? Is that a false uh, statement? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it would be like higher levels. I, I think that's the only part that I would take issue with. It's okay. certainly well known that the CIA and the FBI and all of the intelligence agencies love to recruit out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. And the church is actually quite proud of this. Like you'll actually, if you're on Twitter and you're trying to talk to somebody about this, they'll say, well, it's because of our clean living, right? We don't drink, we don't do drugs. It's because we can speak foreign languages because we go and serve missions, right? And we're required to learn how to speak the, the language of the people where we serve missions. Um, it's because we take orders very well, which is certainly true, right? And so there's almost a pride amongst the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints about the fact that uh, the FBI and the CIA and sort of just the military industrial complex as a whole loves to recruit Mormons. I think the only thing I would say is that, at least in my research, I haven't seen, I mean, there's certainly like no directors of the FBI that are Mormon that I'm aware of. There are like area, um, like San Diego, like the head of the FBI in San Diego was a Mormon. And you can find in Spencer W. Kimball's journals, him talking about going to San Diego and staying in the home of this FBI stake president, I believe he was. Um, and, you know, and he talks very openly about it. It's not like a secret, you know, but I think, I think in my opinion, this is just my opinion, but I think that Mormons are really useful idiots when it comes to the intelligence community and the military industrial complex. And I think that they take a great deal of pride in being the lackeys of some even more like wicked people than they are, right? And, and I think that the CIA and the FBI loves that. I think they love the fact that they have this group of people who take orders and aren't going to, you know, get caught because they're, you know, drinking at the bar and say something they, ought, they shouldn't, you know, or like I think the CIA loves having access to this group of people who will do pretty much anything that they ask, especially when it has to do like historically with overthrowing communism, or, or those kinds of things where there was a real intersection of interests between the CIA or the, in the military industrial complex and Mormonism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally makes yes. sense. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, we talked a lot about Wilford Woodruff and the sugar company revelation in um, I think it was episode two. Um, so I'm not going to spend a ton of, ton of time on this, but I, what I want everybody to see is that once you sort of have this really strange proxy profit, idea come into the minds of Brigham Young and Jedediah Grant and Heber C. Kimball, um, they really do turn away from anything that would resemble early Mormonism, and they become very, very focused on finances and banking and commerce and those kinds of things. And one of the major things that happens is that the prophet of the church at the time, a man by the name of Wilford Woodruff, has a quote-unquote revelation from the Lord that um, 
they need to get into the sugar processing industry, despite the fact that the Mormon church has what's called the word of wisdom, which is all about taking good care of your body. So people can sort that out for themselves. But to me, if you have a health code about taking care of your body, then like manufacturing white crack, like sugar is not a great thing because we all know that sugar has led to most of the, you know, not most of, but a, a, a wide variety of health problems over the last 160 years. And Mormonism is a major part of that because they were one of the major producers of, of refined sugar um, using beets. It was beet sugar instead of, of cane sugar. So um, at the same time, you know, that they're doing this, um, what you see is a real infiltration of uh, skull and bones. And this is the yellow skull and bones. We've talked about that um, at length, so people could go back and look at the historical evidence that this is actual Yale skull and bones infiltrating Salt Lake City and the state of Utah. But one thing that I did find in this last bit of research is that, um, you know, we talked about the one visit um, that, um, and I'm going to forget his name again. Let's see if I have it. Um, I don't have it here. You guys might be able to remind me. Um, it was literally, oh, it's Taft, right? So um, Taft comes out to visit Utah, not once, but twice uh, in the years where Skull and Bones is being set up in Utah at the University of Utah. So we knew about the one visit because I went through the newspapers, but just, I think yesterday or two days ago, I found out that he was out there twice at the same time. So clearly Skull and Bones and the United States had a deep interest in the state of Utah right around 1909, 1911. And a lot of the things that we talk about, like it's really them setting up the infrastructure. It's going to be Gillum Advertising, which we're going to talk about. It's going to be Bennett Paint Company, which we're going to talk a little bit about. It's going to be Skull and Bones at the University. And then, you know, we talked about before that this isn't like a conspiracy theory in the sense that we have to like connect all the dots ourselves because we actually have the testimony of a Mormon apostle who was the president of the University of Utah at the time um, in a book that he wrote called In a Sunlit Land. He testifies to the fact that he overheard two members of the Board of Regents of the University of Utah talking about a conspiracy to pull people away, to pull the young people away from Mormonism, which would allow them to get a non-member president of the university, a non-member faculty, and then eventually to overthrow the university and the state. So, you know, if you are Mormon and you do believe in the testimony of the apostles, you really ought to listen to the testimony of John A. Witzel because he tells you exactly what was going to happen. And then I would suggest that unlike the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with their narrative, that all is well and there are 15 men you can trust completely and we're establishing Zion and all the things that they say are going on, I would say it's far more likely and probable that John A. Widso actually did overhear two members of the Board of Regents conspiring to overthrow the university in the state of Utah and that it actually happened. Um, right around this whole time, this whole whirlwind time of the early 1900s, you get Mariner Eccles listed as a charter member of that Logan Rotary Club, okay? And here's where I'm going to slow down a little bit, because it turns out that um, Russell M. Nelson's father, Marion C. Nelson, is sort of a hub that a lot of this story turns on. So Marion C. Nelson um, was a very prominent man in Salt Lake City, and you wouldn't know that as a member of the church, because Russell M. Nelson, the only story that Russell Nelson tells about his dad, or maybe two stories, um, are the one where he finds liquor in his dad's seller or something like that. And he's so angry that he throws the bottle of liquor on the floor and it explodes. And his dad doesn't chastise him and like, what a great dad. And then he'll tell the story about how eventually Marion C. Nelson ends up going to an LDS temple and getting sealed to his family. But you never really hear the full story about who Marion C. Nelson was. And what I'm going to try to do is fill in some of the gaps today. And I could do an entire episode on Marion C. Nelson because he is in the Salt Lake paper um, all the time. He's one of the few people that every year on January 11th, the Salt Lake newspapers say happy birthday to Marion C. Nelson, right? That's how prominent he was, is that he had the papers wishing him happy birthday every single year. So very, very, very powerful. And one of the people that he was affiliated with was Mariner Eccles, who we're going to talk about in a little bit. And most people probably already know this, but Mariner Eccles was really the father of the modern Federal Reserve, which is where we get into banking, okay? Mm -hmm. So before I move forward, I'm just going to go back really quickly. And I just want to point out that Heber J. Grant, as he was growing up, was working for, for banks and bankers, okay? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But that's really what Heber's interest in, was in. He was really just interested in, in making money. And he says it was because he wanted 
to be able to bless the lives of the saints with jobs and those kinds of things. And I don't know, like he's been dead for forever. So I, nobody can ask him what his, his motivations were, but what's really clear through his actions is that he was almost singularly focused on money, right? To the point of like when they called him as a stake president and when they called him as an apostle in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they were literally sending him on quote unquote financial missions to go back East and to go West and go anywhere he could to try to just dig up money to bail the church out from their poor financial decisions. And especially the leadership of the church who were in a lot of financial trouble. So let's talk really quickly about Marion C. Nelson's early life and what you'll find out if you go back into the newspaper record is that Marion C. Nelson was the son of A.C. Nelson, who was the superintendent of education for the whole state of Utah. So, so Marion C. Nelson's father and Russell L. Nelson's grandfather was a very prominent um, uh, Mormon and member of, of the state as well. But Marion kind of falls off the path of Mormonism. And he goes to the University of Utah when he's um, about 17 or 18 years old. And what ends up happening is he gets a girl pregnant while he's there. And her name is Edna Anderson. And you can see that um, in the newspaper, it talks about on August 25th, 1919. And there's some pre articles and some post articles that drive this home even better, but I just don't have time to cover it. But what you can see is that Miss Edna Anderson, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. AC Anderson of 1330 30 street and Marion Nelson, son of the late AC Nelson will be married this evening at the Forest Dale chapel. Miss Anderson is a popular vocalist and has won considerable praise throughout the Intermountain country with her fine soprano voice. Mr. Nelson is a local newspaper man. The ceremony will be attended only by members of the immediate families, which is your big hint that it was a shotgun wedding, right? So Nelson has to drop out of the University of Utah. And sure enough, you know, they get married in August. And a little less than nine months later, in May of 1920, they have their first daughter. And, you know, again, just to sort of talk about Marion C. Nelson and who he was, you can see it says, Mr. meet Mr. Marion Nelson of the Highland Motor Company. Marion was busily engaged a week ago Friday in passing out the cigars to the boys along the row. The reason? Well, Marion is now the proud father of a bouncing baby girl. On the day we collected our cigar, Brer Nelson was, un or the, yeah, Brer Nelson was unable to wear a hat. Notice the number of district sales managers for truck companies, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, in the end, like Marion C. Nelson was a member of the church who had fallen away from the beliefs of the church, just like John Whitso had said was going to happen. And at this time, you know, he was at the University of Utah, became a car salesman, you know, got a girl pregnant, had to drop out of school in order to support his family, which to his great credit, he did. And he and his wife stayed married forever and, and they raised a family. And so like, I don't want anybody to think that I have something against children being born out of wedlock. That's something that's a fact of life. It's human nature and especially teenagers at the University of Utah. Um, and so, but this is the kind of man that Marion C. Nelson was. Now, at the same time, we need to talk a little bit about a man named Gordon Ivans Hyde. And Gordon Ivans Hyde himself is not necessarily like a key person in the story, but I need you just to pay attention to the names here. So you've got Gordon and you've got Ivans, which Rachel Ivans was Heber J. Grant's um, mother, right? And then you've got the Hydes, which is a, 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 like a Hyde Park in England, right? And so when the church had this infusion of English and, and European saints, um, you end up with sort of this aristocracy, aristocracy that gets imported from Europe over into um, Salt Lake City. And one of the members of this aristocracy are, are the Ivanses and the Hydes. And I'm not going to talk a ton about it because it's still research in progress. But when you look at Gordon Ivans Hyde's life, what you're going to see is a man who was deeply, deeply troubled. And he was married and divorced over and over. He was sued and getting sued. But he was also a Harvard-educated lawyer who was down in Mexico for reasons unknown. Um, there are, I've heard rumors from sources that he was actually part of the OSS and he was actually responsible for bringing Operation Paperclip scientists up through Mexico into the United States, but I haven't been able to confirm that through the, through the public record at this point. But what you do see in the public record about Gordon Ivans Hyde, which is the grandson of Heber J. Grant, is that... Um, he ends his life. I'm going to have to go down here again and do this. Um, 
it's sort of a really unfortunate state of affairs where he has on his ancestry um, legacy page, there's a woman by the name of Julia Simmons who has this to say about Gordon. Uh, he killed people and kept it a secret. And he used me as a free slave to take care of his children and houses. And basically he's a violent, sick, evil, alcoholic con man. Now, <laughs> obviously innocent until proven guilty. He's dead. He doesn't care. Right. Cause nobody's, he's not going to jail for Can't any of this, himself, yeah. but like, but what you got here is a man who doesn't have anybody who loves him enough to pull this off. This was eight. This was August 2nd of 2020 that this was put on uh, ancestry and nobody loves poor Gordon enough to go and contact ancestry and say, Hey, none of that's true. Can you please take it down? But you do have people who are angry enough at Gordon Ivan's hide to put this kind of stuff on his obituary page, right? Yeah. So there's a lot to do here in terms of more research. But what I can tell you is that um, the people I'm hearing from inside of these Mormon arist aristocratic families that are ready to come forward and talk about their family history, um, they're giving me a lot of information that is easily verifiable through the newspaper record. And so I anticipate that over time, as we look more and more into people like Gordon Ivan's Hyde, we're just going to continue to find more and more evidence that the hypothesis that we're putting out here is true. And it's people like Julia Simmons who were abused and um, taken advantage of by men like Gordon Ivan's Hyde, the grandson of Heber J. Grant, that are going to help us sort of crack this thing uh, wide open eventually. So keep Gordon Ivan's Hyde in mind because we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some people that are around him as we go through this. Um, but he's not really like what I would consider a central figure because he fell away from the church pretty, pretty early. I mean, he went on a mission and he got married in the temple, which we're going to see in a second, but really, I mean, you guys have probably heard the term Jack Mormon. Uh, Gordon Ivan's Hyde was like, you know, not even a Jack Mormon. I mean, he was pretty much just an apostate from, from very early on in his life uh, moving forward. So Here's another Heber J. Grant story that I think really needs to be told because it really shows um, another step towards the Mormons selling themselves or being allowed or being willing to be sold into bondage by their leadership. So in 1921, if you were to go find the general conference talks um, from October 1921, what you would find is that a lot of it reads a lot more like um, a board meeting than it does a religious meeting because Heber J. Grant by this point is well established in the leadership of the church and he wants to be a businessman. And so he's being a businessman who happens to be leading a church. It is what it is. And here's his part of his general conference talk. So he says, I went to California with Mr. Farnsworth, chairman of our state defense committee and other loyal patriotic men to discuss ways and means in connection with raising money for our government. And as chairman of the Liberty loan committee for Utah, I said to Mr. Lynch, then governor of the Federal Reserve Bank, I pledge you the absolute loyalty of the people of Utah. Okay, now, Heber J. Grant, the more you look at him in his life, the more you'll see that Heber J. Grant was very prone to writing checks that he couldn't cash. And when I say that, what I mean is that Heber J. Grant doesn't have the right to pledge the loyalty of the people of Utah to anybody. Probably. Profit, not a profit. Bankster, not a bankster. It's just, it's beyond the pale, really. But this is what Heber J. Grant is doing. And you'll see him do this quite often when he's out begging for money to bail the church out or the Utah government out of the financial troubles that they're in. He'll make a promise like this. And he knows he can say that because he knows that Mormons are really good at following orders, which is where this whole follow the prophet, um, non-doctrinal, really... Um, really problematic belief that Mormons have developed over a few generations, right? But you can see that it really sort of originates at this Wilfred Woodruff, Heber J. Grant sort of time period, or even maybe even a little bit further back at that reformation, where if you didn't follow what Brigham Young said, you were going to be in a lot of trouble, like in a lot of different ways, right? So Heber goes on and he says, I pledge you the absolute loyalty of the people of Utah. I promise to put over any requirement, no matter how much it is, that is placed upon the people of Utah on one condition, and that is that you will give us a Federal Reserve branch in Salt Lake City, 
We haven't got the resources. We haven't the war activities. We haven't the money. Okay. So, but Heber wants to be in this business world so much that he's out pledging the loyalty and lives of the people that he's supposed to be leading as a religious leader to get a federal reserve bank. Well, they do get a federal reserve bank. And of course it's the Eccles family that's, that's over the top of that. And, and then you really see an explosion of what I would just call the Mormon aristocracy right around this time. Okay. Because at this point they've abandoned polygamy and they've really walked away from anything that would be sort of considered original Mormonism. And they decided they want to be a state and they have Reed Smoot over in Washington, DC. And so now they're in it to win it. And they just, they're, they're really no different than any other predator, like capitalist predator slash whatever predator. And Mormon history really starts tying in very, very deeply with American history at this point, because what started out as a project to get away from Babylon and become, and be a peculiar people and establish Zion out in Utah, which was outside the boundaries of the United States of America when the Mormons went there has morphed into um, manifest destiny slash um, like if they're really like just kind of a prostituted people at this point, right? Like once they decided to enter into the United States because of the threat of extermination and the seizure of assets, they really just prostituted themselves back to Babylon, right? If you, if you want to use church terms about it, or if you want to use secular terms, they had sold out to the banksters, right? Born in what? Let's, let's remind ourselves. Conceived in iniquity and born in sin. And those are the people that Heber J. Grant was you know, dealing with and working with and, and giving the lives of the Mormon people over to. So we keep moving to 1922, and you can see that we have Francis Grant marrying Wallace F. Bennett. So Francis Grant is the daughter of Heber J. Grant, and she marries Wallace F. Bennett, who is becomes a senator of a longtime senator, and then whose son becomes Senator Bob Bennett of Watergate fame, right? And so you can see this as this aristocracy is building. They start marrying and intermarrying, um, like you would expect to see. And one of the one of the major first marriages is the marriage of Heber J. Grant's one of Heber J. Grant's daughters to Wallace F. Bennett. So Wallace F. Bennett himself was not a member of Skull and Bones. But his son, Bob Bennett, was, and a lot of the family members after Wallace F. Bennett are in that Skull and Bones um, network that Russell M. Nelson and a lot of the Ivanses and a lot of, um, a lot of these other um, hides and these other families are a part of, okay? So I love this screenshot because to me, it really shows kind of the recipe. And it's a little bit tongue in cheek, so you'll have to forgive me, but... This is from a newspaper in the 19, um, late 1920s, and it's a business advertising. And what you can see is that you've got Ellis Gilham Company. This is the company that Marion C. Nelson and, and a bunch of other prominent uh, members of the community worked for. It's also a place where they seem to have housed a lot of sexual predators, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, then you have Bennett Glass and Painting. So you've got Nelson at the Gillum Company, you've got the Bennetts. Whoops, sorry. You've got the Bennetts over here. And then you've got the Credit Bureau on the left-hand side, right? You've got the Printing Company. So you've got advertising, printing, credit, and you splash a little paint on it. And that's about the best way to explain Salt Lake City in the 1920s and 1930s, wow. right? Yeah. And it's all there just on one page, right? So... Again, like from, from the historical record, this isn't really difficult to piece together. It's just that if you're Mormon, you're never going to get any history. You're just going to get a made-up sort of whitewashed narrative regarding history, right? And you're not going to know any of this. So definitely like the major players, some of the major players inside of this, I call them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, um, the Godhead of the Reformed, Reformed Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you've really got Heber J. Grant as the president. You've got Ivans as the vice president, and you've got a Bennett as another vice president. Now, this picture isn't about the church. This picture is about a business, and that business is ZCMI, right? So ZCMI is the cooperative mercantile um, that purportedly was set up to um, establish Zion, to be part of uh, establishing Zion, but in the end made some men 
like Heber J. Grant and Ivins and Bennett, fabulously wealthy, right? And so there are a lot of really great resources on this, and I'm not an expert on this particular topic. Um, but what you can see is that Heber J. Grant goes to building a business empire um, really at the behest of, of Wilfred Woodruff and the sugar company revelation. That's really what gives him permission to dig in and just focus on business, which is what he wanted to do and what he wanted to be to begin with. But you've got the Grants and the Ivanses and the Bennetts. And you've definitely got the Nelsons, okay? So, sorry, I'm on a Chromebook, so everything's backwards. That's why it keeps going up and then down. I apologize for that. So, yeah, right. um, as they're building out sort of this network of, of prominent bankers and oil people and railroad people and all this kind of thing, definitely Eccles is one of the major families. And you've got the Banking Act of 1935. And you can see on PBS Utah, they have an article called Mariner Eccles, the father of the modern Federal Reserve. And again, I'm not an expert in the Federal Reserve, but I think we all understand that the Federal Reserve has done a ton of harm to our country and its citizens. And the father of that was a man by the name of Mariner Eccles, a prominent Utah Mormon family, right? And to me, it really is just a different kind of sugar rush, right? Like you eat a, a candy bar and you feel good for a little bit, or you go to the bank and you take out a loan and it feels really great until you have to pay it back, which the church learned uh, in a really difficult way until they continued to sell themselves out and were able to recover, um, which led up to the Ensign Peak scandal uh, not too many years ago. Um. Let's take just one short little like detour here because I know that we talked about like Mormons and the Nazis and I didn't put a lot about this in, um, in today's presentation, but I do just want to point out that once you have Heber J. Grant and the Bennetts and the Ivanses and the Nelsons and all these families who've decided that they're going to sort of turn their back on Mormonism in order to focus on integrating themselves into the American system, um, you end up with some really bad consequences, one of which is this relationship with the Nazis. Right. And we talked a little bit about this and I did quite a bit of research, but I didn't put a ton in here about this. But here's one thing that I did want to put in. So there's a man by the name of Alfred Cornelius Reese. And there's a really interesting backstory about how Alfred Cornelius Reese became the mission president of Germany uh, during World War II. And it was actually some infighting that took place between two mission presidents who both wanted to be mission president over that part of the world. But Alfred Cornelius Reese ends up being a better realer and dealer. And he ends up being the one who takes over as a uh, mission president in Germany during um, the Nazi regime. And by all accounts um, that I can find, uh, Alfred Cornelius Reese was very much uh, involved in cuddling up with the Nazi regime while he was out there and had no qualms about it. And in fact, had a great deal of regard for the Nazis. And this is his wife's um, journal. And since we just got done with the Olympics, I thought this would be interesting because sh she and her husband were actually there for the Berlin Olympics. And here's the, the ceremonies uh, that were happening back then, which we just saw some really crazy Olympic ceremonies not too long ago. But just so everybody's aware, this isn't a new thing. So here's what he, uh, Alfred's wife says about her time uh, in Germany at the Olympic opening ceremonies. She says, now comes a Greek runner with a torch, goes the whole length and lights the big uh, beacon. Then we see the whole youth movement. Now we all know what we're talking about when we see the youth, we say the youth movement, right? So we see the whole youth movement doing drills and marches by brown clad and white and black by young girls. The latter formed a great white eagle in the center. Around circled the flags of all nations and the whole 10,000 actors in a final climax. It was a marvel of precision, cooperation, and attention to detail. Yeah, that's, that is a great description of the Nazis. So um, she says, I hope all will see it before we go home. So you can tell, like, they're not concerned about what they're seeing. They're actually kind of in awe of what they're seeing, the brown shirts and the youth movement doing this ceremony at an Olympic Games in Berlin right around the time that they take over as mission presidents out there um, in, in Germany. All right, let's see. Okay, in one of the episodes that we did before, we talked about how Herbert Ma, who was the governor of Utah, um, was choosing Skull and Bones members over at the University of Utah. And so in between the last time that we talked and today, I was able to locate a newspaper article that shows the relationship, that there was a relationship between Marion C. Nelson and Herbert Ma. So what you have here is a meeting that's being planned by oil dealers. 
I can't read that, but it looks like more than 500 petroleum dealers of Utah are expected to attend the annual convention of the Utah Association of Petroleum Retailers. And you got to go all the way down to the bottom. But what you'll see here is at the 2 p.m. meeting, speakers will be Marion Nelson. That's Russell M. Nelson's father, president of Gillum Advertising. Sorry, lost it again. Oops. It's my fault. That's all right. And then what you'll see is Marion Nelson, and you'll see, um, and I said Ma, but it's maybe, Charles R. Maybe. Okay. So Nelson is running around with um, former governors, right? He is um, around this time. Do, 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 and I have that wrong. So I'll have to correct that. My apologies to everybody. It's not, it's not Ma. So, but he's, he's hanging out with former governors. He's hanging out with railroad industry people. He writes an article where he talks about how MC Nelson, that's Marion Clavar Nelson, says when railroads, when railroads enjoy good business, other industries prosper also. Okay. And if you were to look at all of the newspaper articles, what you would see is that Marion C. Nelson is deeply, deeply entrenched in the railroad interests out of Salt Lake City. You can also see that he's doing work for the Red Cross, which we talked about in one of our other episodes about how the Mormon church through just serve is really um, deeply tied in with some of these uh, more questionable philanthropic organizations, right? But what you can see is that there's a guy by the name of Gadsby and he's the president uh, and general manager of Utah Power and Light. And they're doing a, a financial drive for the Red Cross. And what you see is that who's in charge of that? It's Marion C. Nelson, president and manager of the Gillum Advertising Agency. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is just show you that Marion C. Nelson was not just a person in Salt Lake City. He was like one of the top people in Salt Lake City, right? And why this is important to me is that, and we talked about this a little bit, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pause here for just one second just to go back over what we talked about before, which is this. Russell M. Nelson is not really like a prominent person in the community, except that he's the son of Marion C. Nelson, until Marion C. Nelson is elected as president of Salt Lake City Rotary, in the 1940s, mid 1940s. And then all of a sudden, um, Russell M. Nelson becomes the big man on campus and his picture is all over the yearbook and he gets put into Sigma Chi in a very strange way that I haven't really quite been able to lock in, but it seems that he wasn't, he didn't come into to Sigma Chi at the right time, like as a freshman, like you would expect, but it's much later on after his dad gets elected to be the president of Salt Lake City Rotary that Russell M. Nelson's life really takes off. Um, and he, he becomes extremely prominent on campus after this, this, after his dad, um, gets this really important position, right? Now we talked about the fraternities and we talked about, um, skull and bones, but there's also Sigma Chi and Pi Kappa Alpha. And what I want to show is that these are the, the guys that are, are working with each other. So what you can see is the connection between Gillum advertising and Sigma Chi, because what you have is, um, Sigma Chi, the alumni spring golf tourney is going to get underway on Friday afternoon at the Salt Lake Country Club, according to Lon Richardson. And what's Lon Richardson's job? Well, he's the vice president of Gillum Advertising. Okay. So Sigma Chi is feeding into Gillum Advertising. They're also marrying their people off to the Hyde family. So you remember Gordon Ivan's Hyde? he gets married to a Garf in 1947. And Garf is one of the major automobile dealers out there in Utah. And what they'll do is they'll take the Sigma Chi boys and they'll give them a job as a salesperson um, over at the Garf uh, automobile dealerships amongst other opportunities. But you can just sort of see this, like if they're just intermarrying, mixing, and they're just really building up sort of this fortress of, of aristocracy inside of Salt Lake with these families, the Garth family, the Hyde family, the Ivanses, um, the Bennetts, the Nelsons, so on and so forth, right? There's one other name that I want to just introduce at this point, and I just want you to remember the name. So this is a picture, I'm gonna try to blow this up without losing it. This is a picture of the Temple View Stake Presidency in 1955, I believe. And the name is John R. Burt, that's him, John R. Burt. Okay. I just want you to hold on to that name. And before we go, I just want you to notice that he's been put into a stake presidency 
with a man by the name of Thomas S. Monson, who eventually became the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, what we know about Thomas Monson, based on the testimony of a woman who was abused by his best friend and um, one of the leaders of the Deseret News, uh, O. Preston Robinson, is that Thomas S. Monson was keenly interested in knowing on what part of Salt Lake he needed to move into if he wanted to be fast-tracked in Mormon leadership. And apparently he was told to move into the Temple View stake. So keep in mind that there are abuse cases going on in this stake that have never been addressed properly, that Thomas S. Monson was looking to become a prominent leader, and that this guy John R. Burt is in a stake presidency with him. And we're going to come back to John Burt in a little bit. Before we move on, one thing I want to point out is that Gordon Ivins was a member of that Mount Olympus, Utah community that we talked about in the other parts of, of this series. And so for those who are just tuning in, um, Mount Olympus is a community that was built by a bunch of rich, prominent Mormons, and they ironically named their community after the Greek gods. So, you know, again, mm. for those who aren't members of the church, this is probably not a huge deal. But for those who are members of the church, like the irony here, and it's just kind of like the ickiness of it, I guess, if you want to put it that way, is is just, it's it's almost too good to believe because you've got people who are claiming to be the chosen people of God making a bunch of money and then going out and building communities that they call, they, they name after the, the Greek gods. And it turns out that Mount Olympus is a huge hotbed of sexual perversity or perversity, excuse me, and abuse. And we talked about that in some of the other things, and we're going to talk about it a little bit further down, but basically just to give everybody a heads up, Mount Olympus is where Brian David Mitchell was at. That's the one that, that kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. Um, you've got the murderer of Casey Woody who was in Mount Olympus. Um, and you've got a man by the name of Bill Karstensen who um, abused in Mount Olympus and then went on to abuse dozens of victims in Bountiful, Utah. And that, that becomes a really important part of our story later on. But so Mount Olympus is, is where the rich Mormons go to create their, their you know, home of the gods. And it turns into like a living hell for the kids living in that community because there's a bunch of sexual predators there and it never gets taken care of up to today. To show how much they really like the Greek gods, you can see in the newspaper record that Hyde, Gordon Ivan's Hyde, starts a company and he calls it um, the Apollo Corporation. And this is an interesting story in and of itself, but we just don't have a ton of time to talk about it. But the Apollo Corporation is being led by a woman by the name of Audrey Starnes. Well, Audrey Starnes was the founder of a group called Key Punch and Allied Services and Computer Data Systems. So for those of you who've watched part one and two, you'll know that the Mormon church and the CIA and IBM appear to have had a pretty close relationship. And the church was asking the CIA for access to IBM equipment. And it just so happens that Apollo, based out of Salt Lake City, owned by Gordon Hyde, is run by a woman who had other companies out in California called Key Punch and Allied Services and Computer Data Systems, right? So I'm going to have to kind of leave that for what it is for right now. But Again, like I think the more that we dig into people like Gordon Ivan's Hyde, the more we're going to see those ties between sort of computer information systems like um, CIA, FBI, military industrial complex, Greek gods, like, and it's all, it all comes together into a nice, neat little package if you're just willing to stop and look at the historical record instead of listening to general conference talks, right? Um, okay, let's stop there because that's really sort of the historical background of like this aristocracy forming and setting up a system which allows them to sort of behave in ways that you would not expect to see religious leaders uh, behaving and get away with it. And so that's sort of the first half of what I wanted to talk about today. And then now I want to talk about the consequences, but let's stop here. And if any of you guys, if you guys have any questions or anything about sort of the history of this, I'd be happy to, to field those questions and see if I can answer them for you. I'll, I'll ask the, the first quick question. Um, we're talking about um, the woman who was in charge of the computer systems um, and how there was that link between the CIA and IBM, which we know that IBM was part of the Nazis with their um, computing, their whole punch system back whenever they were, you know, logging everybody in. I wonder if there was any correlation because they do because of the association with Brigham Young and Yale and Harvard and all those, there mm -hmm. there was the pre-Silicon Valley that was going on around the 40s and 50s um, and some of the think tanks 
and some of the ideology that comes out of there was also heavily associated with the Club of Rome. And so okay. I'm wondering if there was ever like a link back and forth between those think tank parties as well as what was going on in Utah. Yeah. So let me tell you two stories about that that I think will will help begin to answer that question. I, I don't have a final answer, but let me let me tell you two stories okay. that will begin to answer that. So one of the major hubs that we have found in terms of abuse in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is down in Palo Alto, California, which is, of course, where Stanford is, which is, of course, where all those think tanks are, right? Right. And so one of the Mormon apostles by the name of Haight, David B. Haight, was the mayor of Palo Alto for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And, And what you'll see is a lot of gifted Mormons end up in Stanford inside of their sort of research projects, but then, and then also like running a lot of these things. Right. Mm. And so I certainly believe that um, from San Francisco all the way down to Southern California, um, and really entire, that entire West coast, cause you're going to see it in Washington and Oregon too. Right. But I certainly believe that you're going to see that. And we just, we happened like, as we were doing our abuse research, what you'll find out is that there were a lot of abuse cases out there from that Palo Alto group. And then you can sort of trace it as they disperse from Palo Alto that then abuse starts popping up in the places where these people have moved, right? Now, a lot of this is stuff that we can't publish because it's living victims who aren't ready to come forward and have their lives trashed um, by this powerful corporation, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so, but we've done all this mapping and we can see it very clearly that Palo Alto is definitely one of the major centers out West. The other story about this is, is, is a personal story. So when I was graduating from Brigham Young University, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I ended up landing on um, the idea of going out to um, Pepperdine University um, in the School of Public Policy. And um, I, I was able to get into that school, I think, largely because I was Mormon. Like, I had a conversation with... Um, uh, the counselor, the guidance counselor out there. And the second that she heard that I was Mormon, she perked up, right? And all of a sudden there were scholarships available for me. And so I did, I went out for a year. Now I didn't complete that degree because there was a cheating scandal while I was there. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the first year I was there and it was, it was a two year old scandal The the people before me had cheated. And then when my class came in, the people who had cheated the previous year had cheated with a group of people that came in with me to to be able to pass a test. And we unearthed that cheating scandal. And of course, when I went to go um, address that with the dean of the school, he basically told me to futz off, right? And so I just left the school. I just wasn't in a place where I was ready to fight that fight. But Pepperdine Public Policy was a bunch of Reaganites. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we talked about how powerful and influential the Mormons were inside of the, yes. the Reagan administration yes. because of, um, oh, and I'm, I'm going to forget his name right now, but it's Dick Worthlin, right? And so, yeah, I mean, I think your instincts there are, are absolutely spot on. And you're going to find, oh, another really good example that I'm thinking of just right off the top of my head is Garrett Gong, right? Garrett Gong is an apostle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints right now. He's also counsel on foreign relations, and he also worked um, hand-in-hand with Kissinger's think tank, right? So, yeah, this, I mean, certainly you're going to find a ton of Mormon influence inside of, of those think tanks and research right. institutes, and, and like the Irene Institute was a big military industrial complex institute based out of Utah, and, right, and, right, and Henry right. B. Irene is currently in the presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So yeah, certainly this Mormon aristocracy is going to be deeply, deeply entrenched in that in that side of things as well. Yeah. Okay. So I began scrolling down too. Like this was towards the end, but I, I mean, just again, just to sort of show that like your your instincts are correct here. This is somebody that that I interact with on um, Twitter every once in a while, and I'm not even going to try to say the name because I don't want to offend anybody and I don't know how to pronounce it. But just yesterday. I got this Twitter message that says, your church, meaning the Church of Jesus Christ, already said, apparently he doesn't know I'm excommunicated. But he says, your church received massive amounts of money from the Quant family and the Habsburgs via Swiss accounts. Okay? Now, the Quant family is BMW, right? And But he's also, the Quant, Quant was, was a literal Nazi. I mean, if you just Google Quant, you'll see that he was a part of that of, of the Nazis, right? Mm-hmm. So what this guy is claiming, and this man Harlow claims to have done work for the, the chief of staff of uh, the Defense Department or something like that, um, building drone swarms. And what he's claiming is that he has knowledge about the LDS church um, 
getting a ton of money from the Quant family and the Habsburgs versus Swiss accounts. Now, I have not validated this, but the interesting thing about this is that guess where that Nazi German, not Nazi, excuse me, guess where that German um, mission president served his mission before he became a mission president? He was in Switzerland and then became mission president of Germany. So what's being claimed here lines up fairly well with what I already know. It's just a matter of can you trace the financial transactions, right? right. Which that's not really my thing. Like I don't like I'm not like whenever I get to real estate deals or financial transactions, I my eyes glaze over because I don't know how to <laughs> interpret that. But again, just to give you an idea of like how sort of like on the nose you are with your question, I mean, there's certainly claims out here that the church has received a lot of money from literal Nazi families, right? Right, right, right. So, yeah. All right. So um, let's talk about the consequences. And um, I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can, because each of these could be an episode in and of themselves. But I just want to show people what happens when a group goes from trying to be an eternal organization, which I think the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was trying to do when it was founded, to becoming a fraternal organization, which is really what I would consider the church's leadership right now. Like it's a big fraternity. And if you're not in the club, you're not in the club. And when you see that reformation of the church, here are some of the consequences. So we know, these are the things we know about, okay? And that are sort of out there in the public. So we know about the David Hamblin child abuse ring that includes the Levitt family and many, many prominent Mormon church uh, families, including um, people who took in Garrett Gong's mother into their home and that, that kind of a thing. So that we know that they've been covering up the David Hamblin child abuse ring since the 1970s, right? This next one is my family. I'm, my name is Justin Wolsey Riggs. And I actually wanna show people this cause I don't think I showed anybody this the last time we were here. So in my family, these are people that are in my extended family that I never knew growing up, but that I've gotten to know a little bit over the last year or so because as I was researching abuse, I realized there's a huge abuse scandal inside of my own family. So this is Janine uh, Wolsey Badsgard, also uh, known as the Irma Bombeck of Mormonism. She was an author for Deseret Book that wrote a bunch of um, books about how to have happy families and all this kind of stuff. When in reality, here's what she has to say in the Claremont um, oral, Mormon Oral Women's History Project. She's talking about her major life crises and she says, the biggest crisis in my life happened a few years ago. After I left home and was married, I had a peaceful and safe place to live. Raising my children was a good experience for me, but all through the years when I was growing up and all those years after I was married, there was constant drama in my family of origin. I was abused, threatened, and betrayed over and over again. I had taken on the role of peacemaker, believing that if I really loved my extended family members, I had to put up with their abusive behavior. I didn't understand that you can continue to love and forgive someone. But if you can't trust them to treat you with respect and kindness, you should not maintain a close relationship with them. You cannot remain in abusive relationships without damaging your own soul. The biggest crisis moment of my life was when I realized I could no longer maintain a close relationship with extended family members whom I could not trust. I had to let go of all relationships that were damaging my spiritual and mental health. The event that made this crisis come to a head was the day I received a phone call that members of my family had called blank, who we, I believe is Sherry Dew, at Deseret Book and threatened to sue if they published a book I had written called Healing from Abuse. The book was at the printers and they had to stop the presses. Blank decided to publish the book anyway and use a pen name for me. But members of my family, and this is going to be one of her sisters, who I believe I know the identity of, but I'm not going to say her name today. But members of my family contacted the apostle Dallin Oaks. So Dallin Oaks is going to be the next prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So he's a part of my family's abuse story. This member of the family contacted the Apostle Dallin Oaks, lied about me and the contents of the book. None of them had actually read the book and asked him to contact Sherry Dew and advise her not to publish the book. As a result, Sherry decided not to honor their contract with me and publish the book. Deseret Book had asked me to write the book and I'd spent many years preparing this manuscript. I was devastated at this news. Okay, I'm going to stop there. But the idea here is that like, it's your family, it's my family, it's all of our families. And I can't quite understand how Janine can see so clearly that you can't stay in a relationship, an abusive relationship with your family and not do damage to your soul, but she seems to not understand that you can't stay in an abusive relationship with your church and do damage to your soul either. And the thing about Janine and some of her family that have chosen to stay in the church is that they've been richly rewarded for 
letting Dallin Oaks kill this book. So Janine right now is serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And her sister has served many, like they've served as temple presidents, they've served as stake presidents, and all these things, despite the abuse that was going on in their family, and despite the fact that Dallin Oaks put his thumb on her book project about that abuse that could have helped our family heal, which it certainly hasn't to this point. Um, okay, let's talk about Mormonism's top-selling product. Fake people, fake history, and falsified records. So I think one of the major things that I've learned is that you just can't trust any history written by a Mormon. And that would include family histories. That would include any of the correlated history that you're going to get in any of the documents published by the, the corporation known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And what you end up with is, is a real problem with, um, with fakeness. Now, do you remember that name, John R. Burt, who was called as a member of the stake presidency with um, Thomas Monson? It turns out that he is a criminal, okay? So it ends up that John Burt gets arrested for this. It says, preliminary hearing for a former deputy Salt Lake County recorder was scheduled for April 13th by City Judge Robert C. Gibson at a Monday arraignment. Accused of falsifying accounts in the recorder's office is John R. Burt, age 55, at this address. They free him on recognizance. Okay, the complaint, naming Burt, signed by Police Sergeant Mel Shields, accuses him of falsifying accounts during the period of April 1969 to December 1969. The charge states, the said John R. Burt at the time and place aforesaid did knowingly keep a false account and make false entries into records of public monies. So what you have here is a member of an LDS stake presidency affiliated with Thomas S. Monson. And if you read the whole story, what ends up happening is he pleads down so that the details of the story never come out. I would really, really be interested to know what records Mr. Burt was falsifying and whether they had anything to do with any of his powerful, prominent friends in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Because the other piece of this story is that Burt and Monson and the Ivans family were all very, very, very close. Okay, and I, I'm not really at liberty to go too deeply into this, but my point, my overall point here is simply that the history that you're being presented as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has nothing to do with actual history. It's all whitewashed, falsified narrative made by advertising men like Marion Nelson, given a little brush of paint by the Bennett family, right? Maybe you have to go into a little bit of debt to them in order to get it covered up, you know, and then they advertise the crap out of it. But for anybody who wants to see it, the actual history of what happened in Salt Lake City is right there for anybody to look at and see. Okay. And Justin, isn't that like a conflict of interest considering that they house all of the genealogy history records? Yeah, I mean, well, look, Just I mean, it's had... a private... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh it's here's how it's highly problematic for me i think you're right i think that there are there are, there are lots of conflicts of interest involved but here's the problem for me the church encourages me to go build a four generation family history like it's like part of my salvation really right and they want me to do all the temple work they want me to go into those dimly lit climate controlled temples like that we talked about in in one of the other parts of, of what we did but when i go to do my family history am i getting actual history like I can't speak for a lot of people, but I've done a research on a lot of Mormon families over the last 18 months. And what I can tell you is that not a single one of those families is honest about their actual family history. Now, let me get up on a soapbox for just one minute. And it, it really just has to do with this. Here's the thing that bothers me about this as a former member of the church. We have what we call our standard works. That's our scriptures. And one of our standard works is the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon in one sense is really just a family history. And one of the reasons I love the Book of Mormon is that that family history doesn't dodge the bad parts. So this isn't going to make any sense for people who've never read the Book of Mormon, but I'm just going to just for two seconds talk about it. The Book of Mormon starts with a family, which a man named Lehi is forced to leave Jerusalem because he's telling everybody that they're wicked and they're going to kill him. So he takes his family and they come to America. That's what the Book of Mormon claims. In his family, there are some good guys and there are some bad guys. But what doesn't happen is Lehi and Nephi, the good guys, don't take out the parts about Laban and Lemuel, Laban and Lemuel, excuse me, 
they don't take that part of their family history out and whitewash it and make it seem like they're this like great family. No, they tell about all the bad things that happen in their family so that you can learn the lessons of what happens if you do bad things versus what happens if you do good things. But what's happened in the Mormon church apparently is that we can no longer tell the truth about our family histories. We now have to whitewash our family histories so that we appear to be these Stepford wives and these, these upstanding good global citizens. But it doesn't tell me anything about what's actually going on in my real family, right? And it really seems to be like an epidemic inside of the church to lie in your family histories about what's actually going on in your family histories. And I think what you would see if people told the truth about what happens in Mormon families is you would see a ton of incest, you would see a ton of abuse, you would see a ton of financial fraud, you would see a ton of, of, of things that, that like, if you were allowed to examine the real fruits, not many people would let a missionary in their door, right? Because the real fruits aren't at all what you hear when you go to Times Square and the LDS church is able to rent the big billboard on Times Square and make it seem like Mormons are a bunch of happy, perfect families. It's just not what it is in reality, right? Sorry, that was my soapbox moment for today. I'm gonna, I'll try to stay off my soapbox yeah. for the rest, rest of the presentation. Um, and we're getting pretty close, but I do want to talk about this. So one of the things that Russell M. Nelson did was write an autobiography when he's in, when he's in like his fifties and he's a, he's a great historian. He does a great job of giving us a ton of details, probably more than he wishes that he, he did at this point. But one of the things that he does is he was the president of the general Sunday school organization for the church in night from like 1975 to 1978 or something like that. Well, he lists all the people that were inside of that general Sunday school presidency or, or organization. And as I went through that list without doing any research, I was able to identify 10% of the people listed in that general Sunday school board as people that we know have active allegations of sexual abuse against them. So basically inside the church, you have this board that's responsible for all the curriculum of everything that Mormons are going to learn. And it's full of sexual predators. Now, this picture in particular is interesting because this guy's name is um, Byron Lloyd Pullman. And B. Lloyd Pullman was a stake president. He was a very, very powerful, prominent Salt Lake uh, member uh, of the church. In fact, uh, Curtin McConkie, the church's law firm, actually had Pullman's name on the marquee until he got caught soliciting a prostitute in Salt Lake City while serving as a stake president, Right. Then they had to take his name off the law firm because he'd got, gotten caught doing something that he ought not to be doing while he's serving as a stake president in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This guy over here, his name is Christensen, and he is the president of um, all LDS uh, therapists and psychologists. So he certainly knows about the problems of abuse in the church because the organization that he's ahead of um, is, is getting all the people who are being abused and they're feeding them into the system that he's the president of. And then, of course, you've got Russell M. Nelson, who we'll talk about in a second and his protection of pedophiles um, shortly. Let's just keep going and talking about the fruits, though, of, of what happened after the reformation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, you have um, alleged Satanist Gordon Bowen, who is a very powerful, I think I called him a marketing um, executive in the last uh, episode, and that's wrong. It's, it's advertising. He's an advertising but Gordon Bowen is listed in at least two sets of court documents as a child abuser and an alleged Satanist. But when you go back and you look through the historical record, what you see is that Gordon Bowen has had a very close and intimate relationship with at least 15 to 20 Mormon apostles and prophets over the last 40 years, including transactions of millions of dollars for this alleged Satanist to make movies about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So... I don't really know how that works, but um, like just to give you an example of how close Gordon Bowen is to the brethren, um, Gordon B. Hinckley, Gordon Bowen, when he was ready to get married um, to Barbara Timothy, went to Gordon B. Hinckley, who was the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and wrote him a letter and basically said, look, I know that your relationship with my dad was very close, and I would like to ask you to marry Barbara and I in the temple. So you have, in the end... <laughs> It's a little bit of a weird situation because Gordon Bowen is, it's, it's pretty widely understood that Gordon has homosexual proclivities. And um, I, I don't really have anything to say about that other than the fact that it's widely known that this is a part of his life and it's something that he's really struggled with. But you end up having this Satanist man with homosexual proclivities asking the Mormon prophet to marry him in the, in the temple of the church. Now, Gordon B. Hinckley ends up 
tossing this off to James E. Faust, who's one of his counselors in the presidency. And on the very day that Gordon Bowen gets married in the Salt Lake Temple, Gordon B. Hinckley is giving what's called the proclamation to the family, which is the closest thing to scripture that you're going to get from a Mormon prophet in the last hundred or so years. So you've got like a really wacky, weird situation where you've got Gordon Bowen with this really close relationship up to this day. Okay. So Mormon apostles are in and out of Gordon Bowen's life to this day, to the point where like Goel has listed, I think it's, um, I think it, it's, it's gone as, as Gordon Bowen's pickleball partner, right? But they have a very close, intimate relationship with this alleged, alleged Satanist and child abuser. And they just simply refuse to talk about it and address it, right? And instead, they excommunicate people like me who talk about it. Okay, we're going to keep moving. Um, you can see the uh, LDS leaders' close ties with the CIA because in 1984, when Jeffrey R. Holland was the president of BYU, um, CIA personnel visit Brigham Young University, and the church indicates its endorsement of the agency's mission and its elders' plan to meet. And then it talks about how the elders know that what they're doing could cause problems for the church's image, but they decide to go ahead with it anyway. And I have a name in here, Neil A. Maxwell, and I wish I could spend a lot more time talking about Neil A. Maxwell. But let me just briefly pause here to, to talk about, about Neil Maxwell. Neil Maxwell is also an apostle, or was an apostle, he's dead, was an apostle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Verified employee of the CIA, although I don't think we've ever gotten the real story about what he was doing there, who works for the CIA and then comes to work for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And one of the, the really troubling things that you'll find is that in pretty much every abuse case, you're going to find Neil A. Maxwell involved in it. So, for example, the Hammond case, it was Neil A. Maxwell that gave a blessing um, to um, Rose Hamblin and told her to marry David Hamblin. In the Bountiful um, abuse case, you have Neil A. Maxwell calling a bishop and telling um, the woman who was causing problems, telling the bishop of the woman who was causing problems for the church that she needs to back off, right? You've got Neil A. Maxwell named in a recording of another abuse case um, involving, I believe it's a Mormon mission president, right? But it seems like pretty much everywhere you have a problem like this, you have the CIA apostle somehow entrenched in that story, right? Um, so, I mean, take it for what it's worth, but it is what it is. Like, um, we know that Neil Maxwell worked for the CIA, and we know that he's involved in all of these um all of these uh, cases. And it seems to it's like, to me at least, I won't speak for anybody else, but it seems to me that they've replaced him with Neil Anderson. So Neil Anderson is a current prophet whose name just repeatedly comes up in abuse cases. And it seems to me that like when they lost Neil Maxwell, they needed to get somebody and they slid Neil Anderson into that place um, to take care of some of these things. So Neil Anderson is the one, like for example, that Glenn Beck wrote a letter to in the Tim Ballard case. Like when Tim Ballard was in trouble, um, it was Glenn Beck writing a letter to Neil Anderson, the Mormon apostle, saying, hey, what's going on here, right? So anyway, and there's a lot of those stories where Neil Anderson is involved. Um, in that, starting in 1986, you have Russell M. Nelson, the Skull and Bones prophet, covering up the crimes of a diagnosed pedophile by the name of Bill Carstensen. So Bill Carstensen started abusing in Mount Olympus, but because it wasn't taken care of, of in Mount Olympus, it spread to Bountiful. And Carstensen married into a very prominent uh, Mormon Skull and Bones family, actually. In fact, the real irony here is that some of the children that Bill Carstensen abused were actually the grandchildren of the man who married Russell M. Nelson and his wife, Dancel. Okay? So it's in his autobiography. And yet, when Bill Carstensen is abusing this man's grandchildren, Russell M. Nelson decides that he's going to cover up those crimes because they allegedly involve his daughter, who was allegedly abusing children alongside Bill Carstensen. And so because Russell M. Nelson was an apostle, he got hand-delivered uh, abuse cover-up instructions um, from a man uh, named David Eccles Hardy at the behest of his brother, Ralph W. Hardy Jr., who's a prominent Washington, D.C. lawyer and member of the Special Affairs Committee. And Russell M. Nelson um, puts his thumb on the investigation of, of disciplining Bill Carstensen and so the leaders of, of that stake, who um, is the son of a Skull and Bones, uh, Gerald Smith is Skull and Bones, and his son is the stake president in Bountiful, who also has an illegitimate child uh, from his teenage years, um, covers up this abuse by Bill Carstensen, which leads to um, a woman 
who is employed by the church marrying Bill Carstensen, which allows Bill to abuse several more children after Russell and Nelson covers up the abuse in Bountiful that allegedly involves his daughter. So um, it's a real mess, right? You've it's also got like the a LDS church. modern day Maxwell, killing Maxwell and Robert Maxwell. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, so Nelson and Maxwell and um, Oaks and and all those guys, they kind of come in at the same time. And I, I, to me, I think we talked about it in in one of the other interviews where, to me, you have it starting around 1890, 1900, that they start planting the seeds, right? And it's right around the time that Maxwell, Oaks, Nelson, Packer that these guys come into the what they call the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, that's really when this plan to overthrow the state of Utah really comes to fruition. Because in order to overthrow the state of Utah, you have to, you have, to have people inside the church, because the church is the most powerful institution inside the state of Utah, right? And so, yeah, I think you're right. I think that, and, and look, I think they're all in this together. I mean, in this bountiful case, we know that this church employee um, was, she was inside the church, so she had access to all the top church leaders, and it got to the point where the, the first president of the church wrote her a letter and said, look, if you don't stop bothering us about Bill Carstensen, you, we're going to excommunicate you. So they're not going to take care of the pedophile. They're going to excommunicate the person asking the questions about the pedophile, right? So I have to believe that all of them know about it. I mean, they have a meeting every week, and I'm sure that they talk about the abuse happening in the church, and they decide what they're going to do. So, but there, it's, it does seem like there are certain ones that are more, like, more geared towards covering up abuse than others to me, so. I wonder if it's um, just one of those, like, um, attitude reflects leadership. Right. So, and that's, that's really important, Lisa, to me. So here's one of the things that really got me going in my research, as, and I didn't put it on the timeline, but I have a screenshot of it. Russell M. Nelson is out preaching to the world that there are 15 men on the face of this earth that you can trust completely. And when he says that, what he means is him and the 14 men in the leadership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, I'm not angry at Russell M. Nelson for making that claim. Russell M. Nelson can say anything that he wants. But if you're going to get up and tell me and my children and my family and the people that I love and the people that I've served that there are 15 men that you can trust completely on the face of this earth, you better have lived a life of integrity, right? And you better have led in a way that allows me to have trust in you. And I think that what we've covered today and over the other four hours that we've talked in the, in the previous two parts is like, I'm not here to say I'm right or wrong, but what I'm here to say is that there is another side of this story that every good member of the church should be looking at because, so I always say it this way. If there was a daycare center that wanted access to your children for their childhood, and then you knew that they wanted 10% of your kids' income for the rest of their lives, and you went to them and said, hey, I would really like all the information that shows that the people in your organization are qualified to care for my children, and they said, no, you can't have access to that data. Would anybody in their right mind leave their children with a daycare center like that? Like, they absolutely wouldn't. And yet, when they're walking through the doors of a chapel, all of a sudden people check their brains and their consciences aside because they've been taught since childhood a couple things. They've been taught to follow the prophet and they've been taught that even if the prophet is wrong, if they follow the prophet, they will be blessed for their obedience. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is not true. Okay. And probably the hardest part of my research is talking to abuse victims from inside the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints where the child felt abandoned by their parents because their parents who wanted to protect the image and assets of the church chose to follow the prophet by squashing the abuse into a little box and not telling the truth about it and letting that poor child try to figure it out for themselves for the rest of their life. That's so sad. And these poor people cannot figure out what in the world happened because they're part of a church that goes out and proclaims to the world about eternal families, right? And about and, and they and they spend millions of dollars building this narrative. But if you are an abuse victim in the church, hmm. chances are that the only thing that's gonna happen is that you're gonna get pushed off to the side by these by these fraternity brothers and these businessmen because you are a threat to the brand. Right. So that's by far the hardest part of what I do. And all I'm saying is that if Russell M. Nelson gets to get up and say that there are 15 men you can trust completely, then every 
member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has the right to research these men's lives and make a determination for themselves who they're going to affiliate with, support, and sustain. Right. And I've made my decision. I choose not to affiliate with, support, or sustain men like this. And I do it for my kids, right? And And I do it for for future generations. And there's still an effectual battle here that has to take place in a lot of ways. And it's not that I don't want my children to be a part of the community of Mormons, because your average Mormon congregation has no idea that any of this is going on. And your average Mormon congregation is full of really good people who really want to do the right thing, right? Until it threatens the brand. And then you're just up against this lifetime of conditioning of follow the prophet. And even if the prophet is wrong, you'll be blessed for, for your obedience. And I love my brothers and sisters too much to let them believe that baloney because it's just not true. You're not going to be blessed for following men who protect pedophiles and push aside abuse victims because it hurts the brand. And anybody who believes that really needs to take some time and reflect upon their discipleship, in my opinion, right? If they choose to want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, because I don't for a second believe that anybody who calls themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ is going to get away with backing men like this in situations like the ones that we find ourselves in. Right. So that's just my opinion about it, right? Very well said. So the last thing I have today brings us to literally today, because, and this is really fascinating, and then I'll, I'll let you guys ask any last questions and we'll hop off. But this is this is really interesting. So one of the consequences of what Heber J. Grant did, and Brigham Young, it goes back to Brigham Young, but Heber J. Grant, I think, is really where it got kicked into gear. If you look at this map, this is a map of federal public land surface and subsurface, and the red is what's owned by the federal government. And what do you notice? It's all the states and all the places where Mormonisms are, where Mormonism is really prominent based on the actions of Heber J. Grant and Brigham Young and so on and so forth, all the way through to Russell and Nelson. So I don't know what you guys call it when somebody else owns the land and you work it, but I call it slavery. And what I would propose is that most people out in the West don't realize that they're just part of a big plantation owned by East Coast and, and international moneyed interests. Damn. I would agree. And if anything, you would wonder why they're, you know, want to go into Central and South America when there's enormous amounts of resources in there. And I don't mean to bring this up, but it was my understanding that um, the the battle that that happened south in south of Texas in northern Mexico was near a lithium mine. And it made me wonder what what exactly was the real story you know, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not questioning what the story was. I'm just saying because you hear how um, there is enormous amount of reserves, so to speak, in the U.S. owned by people of Mormon belief systems. And then you see them the in. will also provide an unprecedented opportunity for up and coming oh, entrepreneurs to build generational wealth. Because he was, uh, yo, I think you froze and uh, Lisa? Lisa, Lisa was going for a while. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Whatever. It, that was. Yeah, see, he's freezing up again. And it happens. All right, continue. Whatever you were saying, Lisa. No, just that. Just I wondered if that's why they were going into Central and South America, because of the enormous amount of resources that are in there as well. And if going by what Justin was saying with CIA and how they work together Mm. in tandem, you wonder if, if maybe that is another reason why they're in there. Mm-hmm. That could be like cheap labor to go even uh, mine, like the resources. Well, and that's kind of where, you know, my brain went to whenever I heard that the, the skirmish, you remember hearing about that skirmish, right? You know, between the cartel and the Mormons down in North Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, if you map it, you can find the um, the lithium mine pretty close by. You know what's interesting? And it's one of the largest lithium mines, if not on this continent, but in the world. I could be wrong about that, but something like that yeah this guy still froze uh what's interesting to even think about now too um i remember just from covering skinwalker ranch isn't there a whole bunch of mine shafts all around there too 
There is. Yeah, there actually is. Yeah, there's As a, a matter of, of fact, which yeah. is interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you hear that you hear that theory that um, if you want to know which countries have um, which countries are third world countries, pick the ones that have the most um, resources. Um, and so, if you look at if you look at the countries that are rich in resources, natural resources, yeah. you'll see that it is predominantly all third world countries. And then you kind of look at, and not to, to take this out of what Justin here to defend what I'm saying, but then you see where um, missionary work yeah. is done and it is in these third world countries. Um, granted, I mean, it could be a coincidence. It could be hand in hand <laughs> and stuff like that, but yeah, yeah. it just seems a little seems bit. Seems very shady. Know, uh, they should be probably a but, very rich country just in their resources and uh well and that's and that's the key thing you know you would think that um these countries could profit or at least sustain themselves based on their natural resources but it's like nope you're gonna have other people come in and um take it for you or profit a uh, profit off of it for you yeah so did he come back in or uh he's telling me now that he's having problems getting back on so i'm gonna see oh, um, man. Luckily, he I'm was, so yeah, yeah, luckily he was, I mean, he was kind of in at the end of his thing. I would have liked to have had him, like, you know, kind of properly uh, sign off here, but, uh, all right, I'll yeah. Back in or something. Yeah, I'll still give him one more second. Okay. Know, but, uh. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's very interesting, All everything he presented. Um, of course, my mind is fixated on the whole um, technology I was, you know, and I was interested in the whole school stuff. Like, yeah. I, like I'm wondering, yeah. like, if some of these kids, in a sense, maybe even being trafficked to be put into these places. Very much so. I think so. Um, you know, and it's funny that he talked about the the whole sugar thing back in the 1911, late 1910s or whatever. And I believe that's about the time when the Flexner report came out in terms of like medical curriculum and how um, the curriculum in medical schools was going to be taught from here on out. <clears throat> and it was a huge deviation from, and again, chat, comments, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it was during this time that, um, it's called the Flexner report. I believe during this time it was uh, when curriculum deviated from, I guess, old wives tales, they would like to talk about it, or the actual um, folklore medicine, and it basically standardized, um, um, I guess, medical pharmaceutical type um, practices, and so that's what was starting to be pushed in these medical schools. So when you hear the whole conspiracy of like, oh, it was such and such family that went ahead and, and molded the medical curriculum um, it was happening around this point in time, and this is when you have the sugar coming forth. And remember the whole controversy of how, like, they pushed how cholesterol and fats were bad for you, and they mm. cause cardiovascular disease, which of course doesn't happen until later on. I think it's like the 60s, 70s, but it's actually sugar that does the most damage to the body than fat and uh, cholesterol, and so you almost wonder if this ties in to all of that as well. So. Somebody is asking that to put you on the spot. When, no, no, no. I think it was around the 1910s, 1920s, when the medical curriculum was standardized in the U.S. Gotcha. Again, I'm, I'm going off of, you know, the dust has accumulated on my brain. So I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but it's something like that. But I do know the Flexner report was around the 1910s, I believe. Gotcha. I hope, maybe. Gotcha. Um, um, but. Yeah, yeah, LDS abuse. I, I think we're having an issue here with him uh, connecting again. Uh, so I think we'll probably just wrap it up. I don't think it's, I don't think he's going to be able to connect. <laughs> Uh, okay. But it is what it is. Uh, that was an awesome show. It was a really awesome presentation. Um, very, you know, very stuff thorough, like that is usual. like yeah, is something that I would love to like really actually look into and find more stuff myself. Maybe one mm -hmm. day when I get to it. But that definitely had me wondering about a little, many other things. I, I really did wonder about play, like is this being used to place people or kids into certain situations? I don't know. Yes. Yes. Well, it, you know, the whole weaponization of human migration, yeah. you know, that's the other thing of, um, 
you, you see that happening over across the pond, you know, into Europe, and then you're seeing it kind of here as well, moving upward as well. So you almost wonder if if the ideology is somewhat being adopted the same, then you wonder if maybe they're following the same playbook. Oh. I don't know. I guess that's yeah. that's an assumption, and that's uh, you know a claim that I can't substantiate. But you almost have to ask that question. Very good. Very good. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, in case people haven't uh, seen this man before, he was on uh, recently. He's got two other parts out. Obviously, this is part three. Um, so yeah, go check those out. Um, real bangers. He's all got receipts, a lot of information, really wild amazing. stuff. Yeah. Some of his stuff on Twitter is amazing, so yeah. that's another thing. Yeah. yeah, And his link is in the bottom, so you can go check out uh, his Twitter account. Um, Lisa, thank you very much, as usual, for Absolutely. jumping on. It was always, it's always Absolutely. a pleasure. And uh, LDS Abuse, uh, you're not here, but thank you very much, Justin. That was an amazing uh, episode. And everybody mm-hmm. in the chat, that is what's up. That's why I went live. Uh, I liked everybody's chat, uh, you know, everybody's comments. That's what's up. Uh, at one point, I was paying attention, so excuse me. Uh, you know, I couldn't really man the chat that much. But uh, if you are going to catch the replay, which I'm only going to leave up for a few days because I think this is going to drop uh, fairly sooner than later. Um, if you're watching the replay, I highly suggest to check the live chat. Uh, that is the end of another Occult Rejects. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.